Welcome to the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. If you're looking to create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want, you're in the right place. Our goal is to simplify and make real estate investing easy for you. For more information, you can find us at www.jlm.realestate. All right, everyone, welcome back to the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast. Today with me, I have my friend, Chris Freeman. Chris, how are you doing today? I'm good, Jason. Thanks for having me on the show. Of course. Um, kind of just to start and do the intro, I always like to start by um, kind of letting you talk and seeing you know, what your background is, what you're up to right now, and what your day-to-day looks like. Yeah, you bet. Yes, yeah, so thank you for that. So, uh so I've been in real estate for 20 years, but I've also been working as a high tech sales rep and sales leader for 26 years. So I uh, live in Portland, Oregon, as I've been working in the technology career, um, I've taken that opportunity to take some of those, uh, you know, some of my commission dollars and just kind of continue to invest that in multifamily in my backyard. And uh, sit, you know, started small with a duplex and fourplex, and you know, scaled up uh, over time to 110 doors. So I've been, um, you know, very passionate about that. Very passionate about the high tech sales role. And after 26 years, I'm sort of at that phase in my life where um, you know, part of what I really enjoy doing is is giving back on both of those topics. Got it. And kind of taking back how you first started, why did you choose multifamily? Um, why did you want to get into real estate in the first place? Um, yeah, take us back to 20 years ago, Chris. Yeah, yeah no problem. <laughs> yeah, so I, I actually, I bought my first uh, duplex in 1999 and didn't really have a plan uh, around multifamily. It just seemed like uh, you know, a good idea to diversify and you know, get into real estate. So I moved into, into the other half and rented out um, the other half of the building. So yeah, pretty almost rent-free, if you will, had a very small mortgage after that. So at the time I was working on my W-2, I was in high tech sales and I was really focused on investing into the stock market. And pretty much, uh, probably I had a, you know, I had a very unbalanced portfolio of tech stocks. And at the same time, uh, my company had a great 401k. In fact, they would uh, double the match on the 401k if you took it in their stock. And so of course I did that. And then, uh, you know, in a short period of time, I built up a pretty nice stock portfolio. But uh, if you're familiar with you know, the, the market and the history, uh, that was right before the, uh, the dot-com bubble. Or that, you know, that was during the dot-com bubble. And then it, you know, into 2001, that bubble burst. And so I watched my six-figure portfolio. Uh, went down by 90%. Uh, my 401k cratered. My employee stock purchase plan was more or less worthless. And at the same time, I had just met my, who ended up being my future partner for 20 years. He had already been in the real estate business for shoot, maybe 40 years, 35 years. And it was interesting because I was watching him, you know, more or less retired, uh, continue to make significant income without really impact, any impact to his lifestyle during that dot com bubble uh, versus many of his friends that were pretty well to do. Uh, they all started dialing back their lifestyle. The, you know, they stopped going on their international trips, stopped going to football bowl games, were dining out less. And I just remember seeing that. And that, at that point, that really solidified for me that um, the stock market was a little bit of a gamble. I wasn't totally against it, but it felt like a little bit of a gamble, something I couldn't control versus I watched my future partner have all these assets. It continued to generate income. And yeah, there was a little bit of turbulence in the portfolio, but still. He was making, he was getting paid. And so that's really when I decided that's what I wanted to do. And so uh, kind of, we ended up sort of ended up partnering on a fiveplex and then really never looked back and just continue to build up the portfolio from there. Very cool. Um, I like how you say that um, stocks is a lot more like gambling than real estate because you can control real estate so much more, right? You can buy the asset for a discount where in the stock market, you're always paying market price. You know, you can fix up the property how you want to, you can add value by, um, you know, increasing the NOI. So it's a fantastic story. Yeah. You know, and I will say that, uh, I mean, it's an asset, right? You have physical land, you have a physical building. And even during the, the great recession, um, yeah, the market went down. 
a um, little bit of extra turnover. But at the end of the day, we still had, as long as we weren't too heavily leveraged, we still had an asset. We had land, we were getting rents and uh, everything came back just fine. Um, and it, you know, once again, I'm not going to tell anybody that, you know, there's only one way to do anything. I'm a huge believer in diversification. Mm -hmm. um, but for us, real estate has been a great uh, way to build wealth and more importantly, cash flow uh, over those uh, 20 years. Yeah. So for someone who's looking to get into real estate and um, let's say they have a very high paying W-2 job like you did, mm -hmm. um, how much of their income do you think they should be putting to investing into assets like real estate or the stock market? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I don't know if I have a set number. Um, I, I think it would really just, I guess it depends. What I would say though, is if they want to get into real estate, um, the, the question to ask themselves is how active do they want to be? And, you know, if they want to get involved and deal with the toilets, tenants and trash, willing to take on some of that work, and they can do it without impacting their W-2 job. Because I do think that that's really important is you still have to go deliver on the real cash flow job if you're not 100% committed to making a change. Great. If not, you know, maybe a, a passive investment is a better route where you can invest with, uh, you know, a, a sponsorship team that, that's raising money and be a limited partner where you can invest, get the returns, get the upside, not have to sign on the loan, not have to deal with the operational side of it you know, and add that real estate to your portfolio, you know, and then maybe after doing a couple of those, you, you realize that, huh, you know, maybe there's something more here, or maybe I want to get more active. And, and that's always an option as well. Gotcha. Um, and how are you able to personally own and self-manage, you know, 110 doors while working in a, you know, demanding sales tech role or tech sales role? <laughs> well, it did, it got a little bit harder as we started to get to that about that hundred uh, unit mark, but it, Definitely helped having a partner. I could not have done it on my own. Initially, my mindset told me I couldn't do it on my own. But then the reality is, as you start to scale and want to continue to deliver in your W-2 job, uh, you have to have a partner or partners. And in, in my case, I had a partner. We had a really good level of trust in a division of labor. And we focused on the things that we felt like we were the best at or that we enjoyed the most. And he liked doing the maintenance. He liked going to Home Depot. He liked working with the tradespeople, um, liked being uh, quick to respond when there was a problem. And he was also partly retired, so he could do that. Um, and I would handle the leasing, tenant relations. He didn't really want to engage with the tenants. And so I took over that piece, took over anything related to the, to the financing, getting the loans, refinancing the loans, uh, actually handling the acquisition or disposition of a property, um, so we had a really good division of labor. And there was times where my, when my W-2, being that I'm commission-based, when I'm getting to the end of the year and I have to hit a certain bucket to release those accelerated commission dollars, yeah, there were some challenges. And that was, you know, when having a partner, I could either step back and have him step in or more importantly, hire somebody else to step in to maybe pick up some workloads to continue to take care of the assets so I could focus on my W-2 at the time. And that's what we did. Uh, a couple times over the years. Gotcha, gotcha. And how has um, your sales experience played a role in your real estate investing? Yeah, you know, in a couple of ways, early on when looking at, you know, how do we want to market uh, a property to tenants? Um, you know, I definitely kind of put my sales and marketing hat on, uh, but I'll, I'll apply it more to what I'm doing today is, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're working on larger um, acquisitions, 100 units and up. Uh, you know, raising capital from investors to invest alongside of us in a, in a passive role. Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about um, how to put my brand out there, how to communicate with investors, which I just view as my customers like I would in any other sales role, right? I need to take care of them. I need to go acquire them. I need to nurture them. I need to deliver on what I said or what we said we're going to do, just like I would with any other customer. If we sold something, we need to make sure we deliver on what we sold. Uh, so I, I just bring my, that sales mindset really to every step along the way when um, working with investors uh, on larger assets. Got it. Um, and that's your company, right? High Tech Freedom. That's your um, company where you raise money and go after these bigger deals. It is. And that's actually a newer brand where I am really trying to bring together the, the two sides of 
what I'm passionate about. So, you know, I, I've got another brand that it's been with me for a long time called Pacific, uh, Pacific Pine Property. But I recently created the high tech freedom because I wanted to merge my high tech business with my real estate business. In support of that, I have a podcast that we're launching in uh, on January 1 called High Tech Freedom. And the goal there and the premise behind the podcast, which is really kind of my new hobby now, is you first need to learn from the best in order to earn like the best, right? We always need to be um, investing in ourselves. And then once you've earned those hard-earned commission dollars, how do you reinvest those dollars into things that'll generate that additional income stream to create that freedom that we're all looking for. And when I look at a you know, number of my high tech sales friends and peers and people that I've worked with, you know, that made some great money. Uh, in some cases, uh, you know, some people have raised their lifestyle up to a point to where it makes it a little bit harder for them to retire because that 401k is not going to fuel that new lifestyle that they've created. And so, you know, if I can help my friends, you know, my network, the, just the people in the industry that do what I do, um, also invest in real estate to build up that additional income stream. You know, hopefully I help them hit those goals and, and those things that they want to be able to do down the road sooner. That's fantastic. Actually, before I ask that next question, are you still in the uh, tech sales arena? Or like, are you still in that job or is this your full-time I am. thing now? I am, absolutely. Really? Yeah. <laughs> That's impressive. I'm a busy man. How do you kind of balance the two um, different jobs or different careers? Yeah, well, so for me, it's all about planning. I, I'm very intentional about my my year, my quarters, my months, my weeks. So I sit down every week and map out the week. I sit down every morning and map out the day. And I, I will say for those people that are in a W two job that maybe have a you know a side hustle with real estate as an example or anything else, I do think. From an ethical perspective, you owe it to your employer to show up and produce every single day. And I don't have any problem sharing what I do now with real estate because I have enough of a track record where I've been showing up every day for 26 years and I've been doing the real estate. And so for me, it's putting those priorities first. If you can't do it, well, then maybe you shouldn't have the W-2 or you shouldn't have the side hustle. Um, but I do really believe in you know, blocking out that time and really focusing on outcomes and focusing on the highest priority tasks, um, getting those done first, and you know, and then you then you can go tackle the lower priority tasks as needed. And that that's that's worked really well for me. Fantastic. Um, switching gears a little bit here, when you're looking at a real estate investment, um, what are some of the key metrics you look at to make sure um, if it's a deal for you or if it's a deal that you're going to pass on? Yeah. Yeah. And that's important. Um, day one, uh, we want to make sure it can cash flow. And, you know, if there's going to be, and maybe we have to go in and do a little bit of uh, work to clean up the operations. Um, you know, usually there's some CapEx work that, that has to be done to maybe raise rents. But you know, I'm really looking for a deal that uh, as it is today, it may not hit the returns that we're initially projecting, but I really want to see some initial cash flow. I also want to look at it from a more of a worst case scenario. I, the thing that I learned personally from the pandemic, I remember when we first went into the pandemic and I'm looking at my personal assets and, you know, definitely a little bit worried and concerned and maybe even panicked. Um, the first thing I did was I said, all right, how bad does rent collections have to get before I have a problem or before my partner and I, and I have a problem? And we kind of, you know, analyzed it down to about, you know, shoot, we could get all the way down to, 60% collections or 40% economic vacancy, 45, almost 50. And, uh, you know, that's about the time when we needed to, when we, we would have to start feeding it and um, never even got close to that. And so for deals that we're looking at, uh, that's one of the things that I want to always be aware of is, hey, yeah, everybody's talking about all the upside and how great things could be. But I think it's really important to, to look at your underwriting from a, you know, stress test perspective. And, uh, you know, I think the market's pretty hot. And I don't know how long things will be good and things could turn. And I think, you, you know, that's not the time where you want to be over, over leveraged or not have raised the capex that you need to do for your project, not have reserves to, to cover, um, you know, any shortage in the operations. 
um, you know, so I'm probably a little bit conservative and, you know, it's, uh, I think that'll pay off in the long run. I love that though, because I think a lot of people I talk to, I'm a broker, so I talk to a lot of investors every day. Um, a lot of them only look at the best case scenario. Um, they're very reliant on their pro formas. If they hit these market rents, it's going to be great. But what if you don't hit those rents, you know, and sometimes their underwriting is very aggressive that mm -hmm. I've seen. So, um, I definitely think that your strategy of thinking almost like the worst case scenario, like being conservative is a huge takeaway because I think people need to know that if some things do turn, you always got to make sure that you can still survive because real estate's about survival. It's a marathon, right? So um, if you do your first deal and you write it aggressively and it doesn't work out, then it's going to be tougher to come back from it. And I imagine, I, I don't know how it is in San Diego, but you're on the West Coast. So I imagine there's probably some limits on how quickly you could raise rents or maybe some restrictions there. So while the, the targets for the rent increases sound great, the reality is if you ever operated a building, it takes a little bit of time. You can't just go blow up somebody's rent and think that they're not going to leave and then create a bunch of expenses. So you have to be a little bit realistic about how long that'll take. Um, if you're in Oregon, you can't raise rents right now more than so much. Right now, I think it's 9.4%. Basically, it's CPI plus a certain percentage. Oregon has rent limits now. You know, other states don't, which are also why some of those states are the more um, desirable states for a lot of the investors that do what we're doing. Yeah, everyone's made mistakes, but like, what are some mistakes you could kind of, you know, hone in on to where, you know, a listener might, you know, take something away from it where you took away a big lesson from, from that mistake? Yeah. Let me get my long list of mistakes here. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> you know, I would say, um, so initially um, early on, it was really the, I can't overemphasize the importance of record keeping and, you know, and that's in all aspects from the, obviously the accounting side, the money side, but the maintenance side, you know, the, the upgrades and the, the CapEx work that's been done, you know, early on um, before, you know, there was any type of electronic uh, ways to track all that. We were doing all that in files and binders and paper and ledgers and, my partner was paying the bills at the time and you know, he liked to do it. And I was I fine. I let him do it. And we had a five plex, five plex. No, we had a four plex where um, it had two tax slots and one tax slot didn't really have any value on it. The building crossed both tax slots, but the other tax slot had uh, the majority of the assessment and uh, that was fine. Right. And so I guess at some point the County came in and you know, we have limits in Oregon where you can only raise uh, property taxes no more than 3% a year, not counting any bonds that were passed. But they came in and just reswizzled the, uh, the assessment of the two lots and, and just rebalanced them um, because the property was covering both lots. So it made sense in a way. But when they did that, they took advantage of that and then bumped up the price on both lots or, or the assessed value on both lots. And so the taxes went up by uh, at least $2,000. And so my partner paid it. I didn't know it. And he just paid it and moved on. And then by the time I figured it out, you know, it was next year. And I was like, well, gosh, why did our taxes go up so much? And so I started to dig into it, found out about it, did the appeal, went to the, the volunteer appeal board. They totally agreed with our case, felt like we um, got shafted a little bit, but there was nothing they could do because we missed the window. And so, I mean, the, for me, the big takeaway from that one was we didn't have, you know, early in the process, we didn't have those checks, those balances, those metrics that we were looking at on a weekly, monthly basis, you know, to make sure things like maybe, you know, your water expense is starting to creep up or, you know, maybe you're noticing a certain unit continues to have higher turnover on a percentage basis versus every other unit. You know, it was all paper-based. And so that was just an example of where it costs us. And when you only have a fourplex and your expenses go up $2,000 a year, that is a big impact on the cash flow. So we sold it and we did fine with the appreciation, rolled it into a 14 unit building, but I would have liked to have kept that building. That's a very cool story. No, thank you. Um, that is a very interesting story. Okay. So what I was going to ask you is um, when you were in the beginning of the process of, you know, building up your portfolio, 
So what is the best piece of advice you've ever received when it comes to real estate investing? I would say, I think I'd go back to my conservative comment earlier. Um, just recognizing that whatever decision you make around an investment, what, however you look at a deal, um, you have to think about it in terms of the long term. You may have a three to five year exit plan, and that's great. You know, pay your investors back, but you also have to be thinking about and be prepared for the long term, right? Markets change, and uh, I think that's that served me well. Uh, I just remember we were buying a ten unit building one time, and I'm with the broker. We're in the laundry room in the basement, and you know, he came from a family that had been a pretty well to do uh, family in the real estate business locally. And he was sharing with me what somebody had shared with him is, you know, real estate's great, but it's the slowest way to get rich. And, uh, you know, that always, I just vividly remember him saying that sitting in that laundry room. And, you know, it's, it's true. Um, but it's, you know, I think you've got to have that mindset. The get rich quick, this is not the space for you. It's great advice. Um, what is your favorite part about being a real estate investor? You know, right now I am having a ton of fun. Um, just networking with all the other people in the business. And because we're doing larger deals, you know, working as a team, I never really enjoyed any role where it's just me, right? I don't want to be the only person doing it. I enjoy being part of a team. Uh, I enjoy sitting down with my team and strategizing on a project, um, looking for new projects. Uh, like just today, we had an asset management call and we were talking about the... Um, some ideas and some plans around uh, some siding, some paint. And, you know, we had this, these funky fences at this one property with that when they were put in. And I, by the way, I'm not a design or architect guy. That's probably like my least um, or my worst skill. But it was fun to kind of strategize because all these units have, they're all one story and they all have fencing. But when they did it, all the fencing was offset. You know, one was higher, one was lower. One was higher, one was lower. Well, now, you know, they're old. So there's a little bit of rot. And timber's a little bit expensive. And so we're like, yeah, well, instead of replacing them all, why don't we just go start cutting the tops and cutting the bottoms off and just shorten the fence a little bit and sort of even it out. And so we were going back and forth and strategizing on that and a few other things. And so I guess my point is I really enjoy the teamwork of it because you can't be successful at scale without the team. And it's the teamwork that makes the dream work. Yeah, real estate's a team sport for sure. Couldn't agree more. Is there... Any other, um, any other podcasts or books that have really um, kind of helped you grow in your real estate career? Um, I've read so many. Just, you know, I just reread uh, Think and Grow Rich. Hadn't read that in a while. And uh, it's interesting. I found a copy of that, that it's, you know, it's, it's the normal Think and Grow Rich, but they've also then added in more modern day examples on top of some of the examples that were in the book. And uh, I, I forget how influential that book is to all the other business development and self-help books. You know, it really was the first book to talk about getting in a mastermind and the power of doing that. Um, so that's a great book. Uh, another one that I just finished, which um, has really made me rethink how I want to put my brand out there and has influenced how I was creating the high tech freedom and high tech freedom capital brand was uh, the three minute rule. And it's really about uh, it's written by a gentleman who had uh, been in the TV industry space, who was in the business of pitching shows like The Biggest Loser, which is one of their shows. And you know, one of the things that he noticed over time was how poorly all these people were pitching their shows, doing you know, shortcut reels of what they wanted to do and big presentations and never really getting down to like the core message and the core value. And uh, he spent a lot of time uh, really revamping how all of that was done and ended up you know, producing and selling and getting investors on board for some of the a high number of really hit shows. And so I think that that's applicable in any business is how do we take what we do and really boil it down into sort of an intriguing, enticing message that people can understand quickly. And I'm not talking about an elevator pitch, but it's just, you know what, let's give them enough information. So if they're interested, they can then start asking questions and have a real discussion versus coming in with PowerPoints, coming in with you know fancy video presentations that um, sometimes are masking the real message. Uh, so I've had a lot of value out of that book, The Three-Minute Rule. I'll have to check that one out for sure. Uh, sounds great. Um, 
kind of wrapping up here for someone who is looking to get into real estate or looking to be a partner in real estate. Um, why do you think that real estate is the best asset class to invest in? Well, I do think that people are always going to need a place to live. Uh, I do think that, uh, yeah, we see it here on the West coast. There's a shortage in, of housing and that's not unique to the rest of the country. Uh, you know, at some point, right, the population growth will start to plateau a little bit. Uh, but I do think that's a long ways out. So I think that, that that'll continue to be a good asset. It'll, uh, you know, it's a real asset that'll uh, allow you to hedge against inflation. So as inflation goes up, right, your rents are going to go up along with that. As long as you have a good, um, some good debt in place, um, you know, you're not going to see your dollars diminish as inflation goes up. Yeah. So it's, you know, like anything, right? You just have to make good decisions along the way as you're investing in any asset. And I think if you're doing that with real estate, you're going to be in good shape long-term. That's a great answer. Um, Chris, it's been a great show. Where can people learn more about you and maybe get in contact with you if they'd like? Yeah, you bet. So one easy way is you can go to my website, hightechfreedom.com or in LinkedIn, uh, I'm just Chris Freeman. So it should be pretty easy to find me and connect up. And uh, if you want to set up a call, just drop me a note. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Chris. It's been a lot of fun and uh, hope to talk to you again soon. Yeah. Thank you, Jason. Likewise. Thank you for joining us on the Multifamily Millionaire Podcast, the show that interviews multimillionaire real estate investors and top producers in the real estate industry. We're here to help you create passive income and achieve financial freedom so that you can do what you want, whenever you want. We'll catch you next time on the Multifamily Millionaire.